welcome to this presentation on 21st Century Skills in the Adult Learning Environment. My name is Christopher Bowe. I'm a Professor of Education and Director of Graduate Programming at Pfeiffer University, a small, private, liberal arts college in Meisenheimer, North Carolina, with campuses in Charlotte and the Research Triangle Park regions of North Carolina. I came to be engaged in this work while finishing my doctoral work. We were well into the 21st century and we're still talking about getting familiar with and teaching or integrating 21st century skills with students in preparation for their entry into the world of work. My doctoral work focused on assessing the level of incorporation of 21st century skills into the academic programs of small private liberal arts colleges. From then, I've spent a great deal of time attempting to move this needle. For our time today, I want to focus on three guiding questions. What are 21st century skills or competencies? Why are these skills or competencies important? And what are some strategies that have been successfully employed to strengthen these skills in adult learners? I've posed these questions to get us thinking before we jump into the presentation of 21st century skills and competencies, their importance, and the strategies we currently use or could expand in the adult learning environment. Take a moment and think about what the world will be like 20 years from now when the students that we are teaching are well into their careers in their chosen professions. What skills will these students need to be highly successful in this world you have imagined 20 years? from now. Another way to think about this is what Alvin Toffler considered. He wrote, the illiterate of the 21st century are not those that cannot read and write, but those that cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. In reviewing the literature, there are myriad individuals who have developed definitions of 21st century skills or competencies. Christopher Deedy reviewed these frameworks for similarities and differences and found that they were, for the most part, similar in content knowledge, that they celebrated skill development in technology-supported or future-focused ways, and that vigorous higher order thinking skills were encouraged. For our purposes in exploring the topic today, we will briefly explore four discrete definitions or philosophies of 21st century skills that have been pervasive in the literature. In his work, The Global Achievement Gap, Tony Wagner examines skills critical for success in 21st century work and living. Among these skills were critical thinking and problem solving, communication skills, adaptability and flexibility, synthesis and analysis skills, imagination or creativity, and a sense of change or willingness to explore and try, especially in the world of work. He argued that a strong foundation in these skills would indeed prepare an individual for the ever-expanding or ever-changing world in which we live and work. The second theory or set of ideas that we will explore in defining or better understanding 21st century skills and competencies 
comes from some work by Howard Gardner. That's the Howard Gardner of Project Zero and Multiple Intelligences fame. In some recent work, he has been working to define the kinds of thinking that we need to be teaching in order to prepare folks for the world of the future. He posits that there are five types of minds or ways of thinking that need to be developed that can be categorized into two groups or spheres, a cognitive sphere and a human sphere. The first type of thinking Gardner describes under the cognitive sphere is that of the disciplined mind. Here, he's referring to the ability to think in ways that are in line with the various content areas. He suggests that we need to teach people to think like scientists, as that requires different skills than thinking like a historian. Thinking like a businessman requires different skills than thinking like a librarian. We all need some of these skills, but for whatever our chosen field is, we need deeper, more focused dives into those skills. When we do this, he says, we can better understand those things and how they impact things in our lives, communities, and the world. Understanding the structures of the disciplines helps people peel away the mysteries associated with so many of them, freeing them to more exploration and to further understanding. The second type of thinking or mind that he describes in the cognitive sphere is the synthesizing mind. This is exactly as it states the ability to take information apart, move it around, and put it together again in ways that make sense to you and to other people. Brain research suggests that our brains are pattern-seeking devices, and we as human beings desire things to make sense. Having the ability to take things apart, move things around, Note the patterns or connections that we see, and reassembling them for meaning is something that we all strive to do. Building skills in this area so that we are more efficient and effective in that endeavor only makes us stronger. The final type of thinking within the cognitive sphere is the creating mind. In this area, Gardner is not just talking about fostering artistic abilities, but rather he suggests that the creating mind is one that looks beyond, that asks new questions, stretches boundaries, experiments, makes novel suggestions, and things of that sort. Creators often fail. But creators pick themselves up and they try again. And those creators are likely to forge a new creative achievement. Creative thinkers, he argues, do not shrink away from the unexpected, but they work to understand it. One of the characteristics of the creating mind is perseverance. Jumping across spheres to the human sphere, Gardner proposes, that, proposes the respectful mind as the first of two ways of thinking. Here, he deals with our human need for interaction and being social. This is where he suggests the cultivation of people skills or management skills. In his writing, he discusses that in workplaces, successful teamwork very often depends more on the management and the people skills that one uses than in the e technical expertise of those leaders. Folks seem to respond favorably when they're treated with respect, when their ideas are listened to, 
and when pros and cons are examined. You see, respect does matter. The final way of thinking that he describes in the human sphere is the ethical mind. In this way of thinking, Gardner states that individuals need the ability to combine their work and world roles, ultimately being good workers and good citizens. Gardner argues that a good worker generally does have a set of principles and values that he or she can state and by which he or she can live. When this mind is appropriately developed, the worker is transparent and does not hide what he or she is doing. He or she goes on to say that ethical workers are not hypocritical, but abide by their guiding principles, even when they go against what's in their own self-interest. While Gardner notes that there are five minds for the future, they are or should be developed in the order that's described here. Starting with the respectful mind, moving through the disciplined and creative minds, following along with the synthesizing mind, and cultivating near the end as a capstone the ethical mind. You'll see in some cases the ideas build on one another or support one another. Another group that has worked on developing a framework for 21st century learning is the Partnership for 21st Century Skills. The first area under the framework is, a, is core subjects and 21st century themes. This is the focus on content-specific learning and cross-cutting ideas that can be connected to the various subjects. On this particular slide, I included ideas in the disciplines that are more specific to higher education than to that of K-12. The partnership describes both. Note that the themes are things that do indeed cut across content areas and connect in different ways to those ideas. Global awareness, civic, health, financial, and environmental literacy are among those themes. Next, the partnership categorizes skills into a category titled Learning and Innovation Skills. Here you see the big C's, communication, collaboration, critical thinking, and creativity. We move on to information, media, and technology skills. Here the partnership combines technology skills with information information and media literacy. Critical skills in an ever-increasing media-saturated world. Of special note in my mind are the two sub-skills, manage information and analyze media, skills we definitely need folks developing today. Life and career skills are the next category. In this grouping of skills, we find all of the soft skills that are required to successfully manage in a more complex, culturally diverse workforce and community. Along with the social skills are the personal skills that are needed to be a thoughtful, self-reflective individual who is focused on growth and improvement. I point out to my own students when they are exploring the partnership's ideas that these are not new skills. We've always needed these skills to some degree or another. In the 21st century though, we will all need them in a more concentrated manner. We will rely on these a great deal in our everyday living 
and working. Crockett, Jukes, and Churches are the authors of the final set of fluencies that we will explore. In their work, you will see that they leverage a variety of actions into categories that are similar to the other frameworks we've been exploring. This view, in my mind, is action-based and can be seen as a little more universal in its application to various subject areas or disciplines. There is really nothing new here. It is just the way that it is presented in an action-focused manner. Since we've defined and described 21st century skills and competencies, let's take a quick look at why these skills are so very important to the adult student we teach. First, the world of work is changing. Balick in 2010 predicted that graduates today will have seven different careers over a lifetime. Note that he says careers, not just jobs. Certainly, when my parents or many of your parents went to work, they went to work for a company and often stayed for a whole career. Even I have only really had two careers. A few more jobs than that, but education and children's television are the two careers that I've had in more than 25 years. That's just not the case today. Folks are not committing to careers like they have in the past. They are engaging in work that is meaningful to them, that challenges them, that takes them to places they want to go, that connects them to people with whom they want to be. There are many, many reasons that people adjust their work lives. Preparing students with these universal skills makes them prepared for whatever career or sets of careers they choose to pursue throughout a lifetime. Likewise, the types of work that these graduates are being called to do is different. They are being called to do more creative work, work that requires thinking, doing, reacting, adjusting, and the like. This means that they need a set of skills that allows them to change course, think at different levels and from different perspectives. They need to know how to regulate their own work and reflect on their own accomplishments. What they need are 21st century skills. Another reason these skills are so important is that they allow us to better meet the needs of employers who argue, as Kastner, Lotto, and Benner found, that new entrants to the U.S. workforce are woefully ill-prepared for the demands of today's and tomorrow's workplace. These skills in communication, collaboration, reflection, creativity, self-regulation, and the rest do make the applicants for the positions more prepared. They make workers more capable on the job. They allow them to think more deeply, to, to change direction on the fly, and complete tasks from wherever they are in the world through the use of modern technologies. When we integrate these skills into our instruction and practice, we are better preparing students for successful entry into the workforce. Well-prepared workers save employers billions of dollars in training costs for under-prepared entrants. With people being able to work from home or office and connect with other people working anywhere across the globe, it is important that we have prepared students in the appropriate uses of technologies, global citizenship, 
interpersonal communication and understandings, and the other competencies that make up 21st century skills. A smaller world means more and different interactions with more and different people. This reason is a bit specific or personal, I suppose, but I do think it can be applied across institutions. My institution chose critical thinking and engaged learning as the tenets of its quality enhancement plan for the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools Council on Colleges. This was an area where the institution felt it had room for to continually improve. 21st century skills are aligned with both of these initiatives, engaged learning and critical thinking. My division is also accredited by the Council for the Accreditation of Educator Preparation, and we use 21st century skills as a component of our comprehensive assessment system to monitor student progress and skills acquisition throughout the teacher education program. Finally, 21st century skills instruction is best practice. In Crisis on Campus, a book by Mark Taylor, he notes that one thing we as college and university faculty need to do is step back from the traditional notion of college instruction, the lecture and test mode. In a book I'm reading to prepare for some classes next semester, I came across some interesting quotes that fit right into this idea. In a speech at the Center for American Progress, Amer uh, President Obama stated that, quote, we are failing too many of our students. We are sending them into 21st century, into a 21st century economy by sending them through the doors of 20th century schools. Howard Gardner declared, current formal education still prepares students primarily for the world of the past, rather than for possible worlds of the future. And Peter Senge, the director of the Center for Organizational Learning at MIT, argued this, how has the world of the learner not changed in the last 150 years. It's hard to imagine any way in which it hasn't changed. They're immersed in all kinds of stuff that was unheard of 150 years ago. And yet, if you look at schools and colleges today, they are more similar than dissimilar. With a different world for living and working with new technologies and norms, we must adapt and adjust our instruction to embrace the modern world and look to the future if we want to stay relevant and keep our students engaged and prepare them for success in all facets of their lives as they move forward from our hallowed halls of academia. So, knowing the competencies associated with 21st century skills and why these are so important for our students to master are two pieces to our puzzle. The final piece comes in how we approach incorporating these skills into the instruction that we are providing to the adult learners we serve in our programs and at our colleges and universities. While there are innumerable strategies we can employ to teach these skills, and allow students to build their 21st century toolboxes, I've selected a few that my colleagues across disciplines and I have used successfully in our own teaching. The first on our list here is international trips, and I would argue that's an easy one. While they are expensive for students and time-consuming for instructors to prepare, they are filled with possibilities. A couple summers ago, I took a group of graduate students to explore healthcare and education in Austria and Germany. 
It was a wonderful trip. Students were able to see, experience, and talk to folks who were part of the systems about which they had been reading and studying. This first-hand knowledge allowed for deeper comparisons and for the development of extensive critical thinking. While they were there, they also got to examine cultural components, build relationship, explore new things, and the like. Every student remarked that it was one of the most meaningful learning experiences of which they had been part in their educational journeys. They even got to sing and dance the songs from The Sound of Music right where they were filmed. In my own classes, I spend a lot of time on problem-based learning. A colleague of mine in the division of business argues with me that case studies are exactly the same thing. But I'll argue that they are a little bit different. We will agree, though, that we engage many of the same skills when we engage students in either problem-based learning or in case studies. And that examining a close-to-life problem and developing a thoughtful solution to be presented in an appropriate format is really a wonderfully rich way to explore ideas and understandings. In teacher education, this is a very a fairly straightforward concept and is fairly easy to implement. In other areas, it may take a little more thinking, but can usually very easily be done to expand the classroom and the thinking of students. I taught a social studies course where students were asked by what I term the Historical Landmarks Commission to explore the history of one of the adjacent counties to where the school's located and find a historical event or figure of enough significance that it or he or she should be considered for a roadside marker. In this, students had to engage in research, debate, critical thinking, persuasive writing, presentation skills, and many more 21st century skills. At the end, students presented their findings to a group of representatives from the historical committees from these adjacent counties. One or two of those students' ideas actually were forwarded on to the State Historical Commission to be considered for roadside landmarks. That's pretty impressive for an in-class kind of project. Research-based change projects really celebrate advocacy and advocacy initiatives. Advocacy certainly requires us to engage 21st century thinking skills, 21st century communication skills, and in a lot of cases, 21st century collaboration skills. Mentoring is one, is an idea that the institution where I work has really grabbed hold of and we have developed a culture of mentoring across the entire campus. Here the training and integration of mentoring becomes a place where 21st century skills can be celebrated and encouraged. Having faculty student mentoring professional and student mentoring and upperclassmen, lowerclassmen mentoring provide a lot of opportunities for people to interact and build understandings and relationships around concepts, understandings, ideas, even skill building. Some of my colleagues across the campus, especially in the arts and sciences, often employ visiting scholars as a way that they can invite people in. Inviting people in who are specialists in their fields, who think differently, 
who work differently, who can demonstrate how they use what they know, how they use what they've learned, is really an important way to show how these skills can be used in the real world. And this is something that we sometimes don't do enough of with our adult learners. We did it for small children when they were in elementary or middle school. We did it some for high school students. We do it very rarely for our undergraduate students and almost never for our adult learners. We assume that they're in the real world so they understand how this works and they don't really need to see those people or interact with them or that they'll find them on their own. And I encourage us to do more of bringing people in. The next on the list is about going out or getting out into the community and that's about service learning. Service learning is one of those other places where we can take skills, knowledge, and understanding and connect it to a lot of those soft skills that are critical in 21st century learning and mold them together in activities that help build well-rounded people people who really do understand other people, who see the good in the world, who can help other people, who know what it is like to build a project, to manage the project, to reflect on that project, and to see the joy that comes from completing those kinds of projects. Service learning is another Thing that we often assume our adult learners don't have time for. And it's my experience that one well-developed service learning initiative can make a world of difference. Another idea from this set that is of significant meaning to me in my work is the 360 degree evaluation piece. In many areas of work, folks' evaluations include feedback from those above, beside, and below. In developing a, com a culminating project for the master's degree program in education, we went to business and asked for models. After reviewing how things were done there, we felt that candidates in our programs should be expected to develop their own criteria, define those criteria based on research, collect evidence from above, beside, and below them, sometimes building their own tools to collect those evidences and sometimes using established protocols, analyze those data that they have collected looking for trends, and transform those trends into a report and multi-year professional development plan. This is a significantly ambitious project for these students. At the start, they're overwhelmed. By the end, they're tired. After they are finished and they are debriefing with their committee, they're amazed at the 21st century skills they've used in building their assessments and in developing their final reports, and are pleased with the growth that they've made over the course of their degree programs. One of my colleagues in communications uses collaborative writing projects as a way to develop communication, collaboration, and creativity with her students. The students complain about the process the whole time they're engaged in it, but are almost always pleased with the outcome of the product at the end. Their reflections consistently note that they feel that they have had to figure out how to be better communicators and collaborators through this process and that in the end their product was much more creative because they were able to challenge one another. That's pretty good praise and a pretty good use of those skills. Reflective practice is something we use a lot in teacher education and that folks in other disciplines are beginning to use a little bit more. 
Reflective practice offers opportunities to engage some of the higher order thinking skills and some of the other 21st century skills, certainly the life and performance type skills, in determining how well we have accomplished or done certain things and how we might do those things differently in the future. Most importantly is what we have learned or how we've grown through the experiences that we've had. Reflective practice is certainly a fairly straightforward thing that we could add into most of our practice in the work that we do. And one final piece to mention is that of using thinking maps or other visual representations as ways for our adult learners to communicate their understandings and ideas in different ways. I have a colleague who works in the sciences who uses thinking maps training um, with students in her program and then employs the thinking maps, which are just uh, some very specific kinds of graphic organizers that focus on different concepts of reasoning, and employs those with the students in the science courses that she teaches. Those students are then asked to use those thinking maps to map out the chapters that they read or lectures that she gives. They use them as study guides and study materials for the exams that are given. In fact, I've seen her give an exam that asked folks to employ a thinking map and share the information that they had learned about a particular thing through one of those thinking maps. That's certainly a different way for us to think about assessing the learners that we engage with in our practice. I want to thank you for taking this journey into 21st century skills with me today. I hope you found some of the information to be useful to you as you think about building or revising your own courses for the coming terms. If I can be of any assistance to you, or if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. I'm always happy to talk 21st century skills integration. I hope you have a great day.